Okay. Good morning, everybody. We are right on time. Um, 11 o'clock Eastern. Thank you for showing up. Um, and welcome to Groom's fifth installment of our monthly webinar series. This month's topic is a very timely and reflective one of new problems that plants are encountering on a daily basis these days. Our topic today is redefining safety, planning for a safe outage in uncertain times. Safety has not taken a, on a new meaning this year. Uh, instead, it's earned an escalated level of attention that we all must embrace. The meaning of visible and invisible dangers has certainly taken on a new meaning. Safety is a cornerstone here at Groom um, in our day to day. It's convenient that this webinar is a bookend with our first webinar in the series that covered facility disinfection services. You'll see that we um, have covered a diverse mix of topics and hope that everyone finds value in this one today. A little bit on the flow of the webinar, we'll be touching on six of the main points that everyone's talking about, especially now that we're entering turnaround and outage season. Uh, the six topics include pushing work, winning and losing scenarios, cost implications and options, potential turnkey value, scheduling drivers and prioritizing projects, the safety bubble and the methodology behind it, vetting disinfection service providers, and finally, how are things different? I think that's the understatement or under question of the century, but um, it's there. So we'll discuss that in our, and many other things in our 30 minute presentation. I will leave some time for Q&A afterwards. <laughs> this webinar is being recorded. A link will be sent out to all, register, all registrants uh, once we're complete. A little bit on our speakers today. Um, on myself, I'm Steve Houghton, VP of Sales at Groom Industrial. I represent the sales function for the Hersig Refinery, Industrial and Cleaning and Coating sides of the house. Um, I've got the pleasure of welcoming Dennis Crayon to present with me today. He's the president of Experian Safety Institute. He's a certified safety professional and technician. He's a Rutgers OSHA 10 and 30 instructor and much more. Um, as you can see, he's got decades of experience. He's a wealth of knowledge regarding industrial safety practices. Thank you so much for joining us today, Dennis. Thank you for having me. And last but not least, the groom Grizzly um, is welcome to the team. Uh, he's making his debut here. Um, not that he's shy, but this is his first webinar, so he won't be talking today. But we're happy to debut the Grizz on today's webinar. Safety is a very serious matter, and so is COVID-19. That said, I wanted to add some levity to our talk today. All of our companies are addressing the situation thoroughly. We're confident in that. And we on this call, the presenting or listening are all trying everything we can to support safe day-to-day -day operations during an outage. The question left unanswered is, can we do more? Or maybe a different question, more pertinent, should we do anything different? The image here is, you know, poking a little bit fun at, you know, some of the measures that we're taking, but it's part of the real world today, something that we need to consider. And one more piece of levity before we dive in and get serious. Um, I would like to give this guy an A for creativity, uh, but an F for execution, depending on what his goal might actually be. I think the point of this picture that we need to take away is compliance is key, and we'll touch on that today. So, down to the nitty gritty. Uh, outage and turnaround planning. There's two main questions that are on everyone's mind. The first two questions here, what will it cost to have this outage? And second, what will it cost to not have this outage? Having the outage as planned could be easier or be considered easier for some reasons. Perhaps it's easier to forecast. There's more knowns, so to speak. Um, but there's also some more additional costs to consider, some additional um, obstacles to consider. 
A few questions to consider that we're going to dive into here. Can contractors support you? Can they support you labor-wise? Can they adjust to your schedule? Will travel restrictions affect them? And so on. The million dollar question here is, what is the cost or costs to not have an outage or turnaround? The true costs might not be able to get, be realized from between six months to five years, depending on what your outage and turnaround intervals look like. Vendor support and factors to consider. We've been called to support on a work on emergency basis um, quite a bit here in the past couple of weeks. As recently as last week, um, we got called to a job because another contractor was kicked off due to unsafe practices and not following COVID protocol. Now there's some things that might have been given a blind eye in the past that just don't have any room anymore to be accepted, not tolerated. So when hiring a vendor, what are the boxes that need to be checked off? I'm going to review those five right now. Vendor resources. Has your vendor retained a crew through the pandemic? Now crew is important. Headcount is important, agreed. But a trained and tenure crew is even more important in order to get your job done effectively and safely. Does the vendor have a predetermined safety plan? It's important that not just a plan for the crew, but that they also have a plan for the administration as well. Name of the game here is do they practice what they preach? Is the vendor's plan complementary to yours? All this will do is help dot the, dot the I's and cross the T's and create seamless work from MOBE all the way to DMOBE. To understand, it's important to understand your key risks, both short and long-term with your vendor, contract-wise. And the bottom line, can the vendor commit to support your project? When the rubber meets the road and you need a contractor at your facility to work, can they react and help you out? I'm going to hand it over to Dennis to discuss uh, PSM and RMP. Thank you, Steve. Good morning, everyone. Uh, those of you who are on this call may or may not have a direct application in your line of work for process safety management and or RMP, risk management programs with the EPA. That being said, even if you do not, if you're familiar with this list that's in front of you, these bulleted items, these are all part of 1910-119. That's the OSHA standard that governs process safety management. Even if you're not governed by that, this is a great list for you to work off. And in particular, when it comes to disinfection services and what Groom would have to offer, Operating procedures and practices would apply as well as emergency preparedness when it comes to folks that would be coming to visit your facilities. Operating procedures and practices does indeed include all not only your plant employees, but contractors and subcontractors that may be coming to visit. And emergency preparedness is another leg to that. In the unlikely event that there is a, 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 a facility incident, and if uh, folks would have to respond to that and people would have to evacuate, then of course we would have to have something in place in order to account for those folks that may be visitors on site up to including uh, any of your contractors and subcontractors. Next. So management of change is uh, something that you would also find in the process safety management OSHA standard. And this is also something that could be built out from outside of the, the OSHA standard, and you can bring it into your own uh, facilities in, in that it provides you the opportunity to react to and plan for uh, the type of uh, services that, that Groom would be able to bring out to you. So you can have more than, um, th than just one person focusing in on what, po what people may be doing on site, especially if things are going to be changing on a day-to-day uh, hour to hour. So if you've got folks that are moving uh, throughout a facility, for instance, providing disinfection, if you look at that bullet there, anything that can affect an operation, maintenance, or repair is something that you really want to manage. And you see, you see the picture of the goalie on the right-hand side. Do we have one individual that's going to be responsible for all of the communication? 
oftentimes I've done a lot of investigations in my day and communication or lack thereof because you didn't have, I did not have a gatekeeper in place. What would be that individual that can certainly keep track of everyone and everything and the communication to and from that gatekeeper can make a huge difference in ensuring that we are managing any changes that can occur. And who leads it? How often are you documenting it? Uh, if it wasn't written, it didn't happen kind of thing, looking at retention of your records, all of that good stuff. Lastly, uh, on this particular slide is simultaneous operations, which we'll see on the next slide, please. So simultaneous operations, also known as SIMOPS, it's more of an international flavor, but we do see this here, uh, especially when it comes to some of your larger petroleum uh, companies that, you, that are located here within the US, uh, BP being one of them, they do have a SIMOPS program in place. And what that allows is, is a plan and a procedure uh, to effectively manage more than one operation happening at the same time. So the purpose of this slide is really to call out uh, the, the opportunity for us to recognize when we have more than one, uh, say, team of contractors, subcontractors, plant personnel working in an area where they can affect one another's, uh, one another's uh, uh, line of work, up to and including uh, folks that would be coming in to do some disinfection. You can see their construction welding and working at heights, and, and this is a definition that comes directly from the BP website. And again, I, I cannot reinforce enough, the communication is key. Someone um, must, must lead. Someone has to be dedicated to know what everyone else is doing. Uh, very effective way of managing uh, these types of operations. Next. Excellent. That's fantastic insight, Dennis. Um, and it leads right into my next point. Um, the question per assist, you know, it, in this time of the year with outage and turnaround work to push or not to push. Um, when I was putting this presentation together, uh, I quickly realized that although we use the term pushable quite often, Microsoft is, uh, does not recognize pushable as a proper uh, English word. Um, that said, I am going to um, pen it and continue to use it here. Um, when you're determining whether an outage or turnaround is pushable, it's very important to weigh the cost and revenue risk benefits. Then it's important to understand what you can afford, in air quotes, both time and monetarily wise. Part of the risk benefit analysis is quantifying your revenue opportunities, not just your cost implications. Not improving efficiency of a system may result in increased operating costs far outweighing the cost of performing the work. If at all possible, work with your vendor base, your ops team, engineering to understand ROI of a project and um, how quickly you can expect to see results. The cost of unplanned work, whether your budget is $100, $100,000 or 10 million, Unplanned spend is a considerable and uncomfortable percentage of the budget. We've got folks on this webinar that um, are, represent both sides of the spectrum here, but it's all relative. Um, the hope is here that unplanned spend doesn't put you over budget. Unplanned work in some areas such as coatings can account for 10% average. While it's known that Unplanned work accounts for 50% plus of a budget in general maintenance repair operations work. In the outage and turnaround world, it can see a 30 to 40% number depending on some factors. Now, this is not an unknown figure and it's the reason for the refining space having invested so much in turnaround cost planning and tracking. Unplanned work is not the it's not only more expensive, but it, it causes the need to scramble for vendors to show up the last minute. Um, last minute scheduling not only forces expedite fees, but it also has a multitude of soft costs, including people's time, processing, etc. Cost implications versus cost opportunities. Um, the low hanging fruit here is turnkey capability in your vendor base. 
There are many takes on the definition of turnkey, but what exactly does it mean to you? And does everyone on your team agree? It's important that everyone's on the same page with your facility. I made a hybrid definition here based on some of my favorite definitions. And I'll read it to you. Turnkey value represents an end user's capability of leveraging a vendor's strategic relationships and complete service offering. The more, more applicable strategic relationships and service available, the better the turnkey option. I think that wraps that up and we'll get into some customer specific quotes on the importance of that a little bit later. Um, very important also to focus on scheduling impetus. And I'm gonna park on this for a little bit. What deserves your attention and exactly in what order? I think we'd all agree on the four main factors to consider when planning for an outage or turnaround. Um, and here they are. Need, you need the work done or you don't. RTO or production demand, depending if you're in the uh, power gen or refining space. You're allowed to or you're not. Um, budget, you can afford the work or you can't. And fourth, safety concerns, which are a little bit, taken a little bit more seriously now than ever uh, due to COVID. Um, and what controls do you have um, and how are you going to take charge of those controls during that work uh, before, during, and after? So one huge factor to understand here is I think we'd all agree that scheduling impetus um, are need, demand, budget, and safety. But if you were to have everyone on your team prioritize what comes first, are you confident that everyone's priority list would look the same? I think that it's even more important for our, our teams to be in concert and try to plan and execute uh, in the same order with the same impetus. To continue um, on the turnkey piece, it's important to us because it's important to you. We completed a poll of customers in the power gen refining space uh, about a year ago to understand exactly what's important um, in these areas. One huge value is that eight out of 10, 10 of the respondents pointed to turnkey. Um, eight out of 10, it sounds like I'm selling toothpaste here. Uh, I'm not trying to sell anything, but just pointing out the fact that um, turnkey was at the forefront of everyone's mind. And it's important that um, the vendor base acts accordingly and tries to um, assist and give you that value. So I'll read a few of the quotes here, the shorter ones. Uh, turnkey means service. Well, short and sweet. On small turnarounds, we go out of our way to seek out turnkey vendors that can manage all of our work. Very simple. We look for the devil we know in our projects. It comes down to who you can trust. I think trust is the key word there. Um, I think it's important to note here that all these quotes are very simple and direct, but they all bring out different values of turnkey. And that's what makes it even more um, of a selling point here for me. Going to pass the baton to Dennis and discuss some safety practices at plants. Thank you, Steve. So every one of you taking a look at this slide, you can see we've got Shell, Exxon, Mobile, BP, Chevron, and you can go down the list of a lot of your favorite places you prefer to stop for your fuels. All of these folks have a, a safety slogan. They have a culture. They have a logo. They have a... Uh, a tagline, et cetera, about safety and protecting their folks while they're on their properties. And quite frankly, most of these companies, if not all of them, take that outside their places of work as well to encourage uh, people to ensure that they're making good decisions when they're uh, outside of work. So I would encourage you that if you don't already have a program, a tagline, a slogan, a, a, a program that provides for a culture of safety, uh, where you work, that that would be something that you would want to pursue. 
And there's a lot of really great stuff out there. These folks are, are very keen on ensuring that, that people are being safe and, and staying safe and healthy uh, when it comes to COVID-19 at their places of work. Next. So COVID-19 and resiliency. Uh, the purpose of this slide is uh, there's a course out there that I've uh, had the, uh, the pleasure of being able to train anywhere from four to six hours. And COVID-19 and resiliency, if you look here on the slide, the ability to become strong, healthy, or successful, and or successful again after something bad happens. It's bouncing back from difficult experiences. And that's what we're working with now. We're still in the bounce back um, process of this since we haven't seen an end to the, um, the pandemic, but we're working on it. That next bullet I, I think is really telling, absenteeism versus presenteeism. We all know what absenteeism, that's folks who are simply not showing up, but presenteeism, that's a fairly new buzzword in the world of health and safety. And that's, I'm here, but I'm not here. I'm, uh, I am physically present, but mentally, emotionally, I am not invested in what I've got going on in front of me. And, and what we do can be incredibly important and incredibly dangerous, uh, especially safety sensitive positions. Uh, so we wanna be asking ourselves whether or not our teams are fit for duty. We have all of these stresses that are carrying on, not only at work, but outside of work as well. Our family members having to deal with the return to school or not return to school. How many folks are dealing with virtual uh, scenarios uh, at home and at work can really start to uh, begin to wear on. And we're seeing folks go in, in primarily two different directions. Either they're becoming more complacent uh, or they're simply getting, uh, they're getting tired, they're getting worn out, they're getting stressed. And so that last bullet, uh, I would encourage everyone to identify some local resources that are available to you uh, through either your HR, your insurance companies, uh, and then there are also local, state, uh, and federal resources as well, so that you can pay closer attention to your workforce to ensure that they're making some good decisions. Some really good training out there that I would encourage everyone to participate in and not let your guard down. Uh, very uh, important. Uh, next, please. So there's a safety bubble that we're working with, and it's not just one, there are several bubbles and they intersect to the degree that they can. And we also have to manage this as individuals, as planned operators, as companies, as contractors and subs. And we'll take a look at that. Three factors, it was three different um, bubbles that we're really kind of uh, having to manage on a day-to-day, -day, sometimes a uh, minute by minute, hour to hour. Next. So when we're looking at plant personnel, the folks that you have working directly with you, for you, or you're working for them on a property, these are people that you may have been with for, for weeks, months, years, decades, potentially. And we know some things about the people that are on that plant. We know what their travel patterns are. They're fairly localized. They're not moving from state to state um, and coast to coast kind of thing. They have established housing and dining and transportation. They're driving their own vehicles to and from the site. But the complacency part that we're having to deal with, and I'm seeing more and more of it as, as we're now in, in our six month of, uh, of full on uh, pandemic um, uh, work and having to mask up and social distance, we, I'm seeing a lot more noses than I had ever expected to, to have to pay attention to uh, up until six months ago. And so when I see noses, I'm saying complacency. I see people that are that are really beginning to drop their guard and something that we need to look out for. And those are people that you have direct control over on a regular routine basis. Next. But contractors and vendors. So there are some things when you're inviting people, when I'm inviting people onto my properties, there are things that I need to think about. You can see Grizz down below there, he's masked up, he's covering that nose. Uh, we need to make sure we're doing that. So when you invite someone like Groom on to a property and we look at those pros, they have experience in traveling. They've been doing this for a long enough period of time where they have a great deal of experience and not only outside the pandemic, but now also inside that as well. PPE usage, I, I've been around these guys and they know what to do and how to do it. You'll see a slide here uh, where some folks are maybe not doing it as well as they could. Uh, working mostly away from admin spaces. So the vast majority of that work is going to be um, away from the folks that would be considered your office personnel, for instance. And so they're going to be out and amongst the maintenance, which is why I had brought up um, uh, PSM and managing that change in simultaneous operations where you can have multiple operations going on at one time. 
but there are some cons and we really should uh, put a spotlight on them because you may have folks, some vendors, some contractors, subs that would like to come out onto your property and some questions you want to ask about. What is their travel history? Are they experienced in doing this? And what are they going to be doing? Uh, and this is any contractor. What are we doing for housing, for dining? Are we renting vehicles to take ourselves back and forth? Are we traveling in vehicles? Back? I'm stealing a little of Steve's thunder there. Uh, uncertainty, uh, un some, uh, uncertainty and inconsistency. Pandemic plans. Uh, we all began to create plans, I would say, um, roughly by mid-March, the end of March of this year. If you didn't already have something for influenza, I did, I do. And so I had to do some, um, a, a little bit of wordsmithing and the like and, and, and kind of um, um, buck up a little bit. Uh, but the reality is, is we want to have a match or a mate from your plan to their plan, their plan to your plan to ensure that we're covering all of the bases. And shared facilities can be a big deal as well when we invite people from the outside, restrooms, dining facilities and the like things to think about. Next, please. PPE usage, we've seen it, right? You saw the gentleman with the mask over his eyes. You can see we've got one or two here. We've got some folks that are still not doing the right thing. They were not trained to do it to begin with, and they're not trained to do it now. And, and so we're talking about both inside and outside the plant, the community, uh, vendors and contractors. This is a spread equal kind of thing. Next, please. And lastly, for us to consider with that safety bubble, we have our our plant personnel, we have our vendors come out, and then we have the community. Here I am, I'm a subcontractor, I'm going to come to your facility on my way, I'm going to stop, I'm gonna get myself a breakfast sandwich, I'm going to get fuel, I'm gonna stop, I'm going to um, reserve my room, etc. And that's going to be my community contacts. How well are they protecting themselves is incredibly important as well. So when I come to your property, you're going to take my, my temperature. I will be filling out a survey. But all of those folks that I made contact with out in the community, I have not. And then on day to day, I will not. And so that becomes also that, that somewhat unmanageable part of the safety bubble that we have to have and ensure that we're taking on responsible people to our properties. It's our job, as it says, to be leaders and influencers with protocol and action. So next, please. Fantastic. Thanks, Dennis. Um, you know, as you mentioned, you know, a lot of people have been feeling their way out through this process. And um, we've been answering a lot of questions um, of the customer base. I want to go over, you know, some of the big questions that we get asked, um, some important factors to consider when um, vetting disinfection service providers. Here's some of the basic factors to understand. One question to ask is, what disinfection agent do you use? Um, is it EPA approved for COVID-19 use? Very important for you to educate yourself there too. This is all public knowledge. This is not something that's owned by the um, disinfection contractors um, alone. What application method do you use? Um, does the method adhere to CDC approved guidelines? This is also something that you should educate yourself on, not just understanding what the vendor's preferred method is, but understanding what CDC approved and what goes into that process. Just because the process is approved doesn't mean that's applicable to your facility. Might be better for an industrial, better for office, large square footage, low square footage, et cetera. Um, what's your geographic reach? And that goes in turn with what's your reaction time? It's very important that when you actually need the work, when you order it, that you're able to get support. Some red flags that we've seen brought up um, from customers' experiences um, out there with some uh, newer operations, I guess you could say, um, Two red flags to look out for are low square footage price and a high one-time cost. The low square footage price is really a big red flag for potential effectiveness issue. Is it the best price in town? Probably. Is it going to be effective? Maybe not. Um, so educate yourself there. Um, most of the time we see um, a low square foot price, um, a variety or type 
of fogging is utilized or quoted. Um, there's three main variables to make this uh, technology effective. That's square footage, a sealed environment, and time. If those three factors aren't CDC approved based on the technique, you probably have an effectiveness concern to look into. And then Taiwan time cost. This is something I really didn't expect to see, but um, we do get phone calls from customers um, who are looking for a better answer. So um, whether you look at it this way, whether you spend $100 or $100,000 to disinfect your facility today, an exposure with a sick employee tomorrow negates all that money that you spent today. A daily routine and a weekly regimen keeps a standard and peace of mind for your facility and for your team. Cost of compliance, you know, we, we keep talking safety and then we talk money, safety money. There's a fine balance there. In order to reduce exposure and minimize spread, we take a few of the you know, following measures in the field. They might seem simple, but they go a long way as long as you're consistent with it. Driving whenever possible, um, bringing in meals, you know, keeping our crews inside your facility instead of mingling and crossing into another bubble, uh, as Dennis put, is important. And uh, I like to think that, hey, if the guys aren't uh, going out to the buffet every day, maybe they're healthier too. Um, some areas to minimize cost implications, strategic scheduling. Now, I encourage everyone to steal um, you know, a trick from our book. If we're in your neck of the woods, we're definitely interested in calling local plants to see if we can um, work there as well to minimize travel for our crew. Now there's some obvious cost benefits for limited mobilization and travel time as well. So I would encourage you to do the same, whether or not you're affiliated with the neighboring plants. Give them a call and see if you might be able to uh, coordinate and leverage both um, budget and time. Finally, turnkey, we keep going back to this, but you can look back to turnkey as a means of limiting the number of vendors to manage during a turnaround or outage. I uh, found this picture online and honestly, I probably think about this picture more than I should. Um, I think it's funny you know, but it also makes a little bit of a point here. Um, there's plenty of assumed practices that employees, vendors, and local community are expected to self police on. Um, you know, but what can you do to ensure that you're covering your bases and your facility? Disinfecting high touch areas. I think that's commonplace and accepted these days. Disinfecting high traffic areas. Same as before. One area that I really think could be utilized much more and um, you know, plants and facilities around the country are starting to grab onto is leveraging vendors with that turnkey option to complete not just the scheduled work to clean or paint or weld or do what have you, but also to disinfect. Not only are you limiting number of POs and soft costs, but you have less folks at your facility with the potential to cross contaminate. So we've chatted on a lot here in the past 30 some odd minutes. A few takeaways to consider. Pushing work might sound like the best short term option. Is it your best long term option? Weigh your benefits, both on the revenue and cost side. Prioritizing outage work. What does your priority order look like? Is it optimal? And does everyone on your team agree and plan accordingly? Need, production demand, budget, and safety concerns are the four variables or boxes to check off. Turnkey has value at many turns. It's a great time to reevaluate your vendor base, both based on depth and capabilities. It's a good time to review quality, qualified vendor selection. Just like your equipment has different demand on it today than it did five and 10 years ago, 
so do your vendors. We should act accordingly and plan that way. Is everyone meeting their expectations? So with that, um, I am happy and thankful for Dennis and the Grizz to have um, helped us out on our fifth webinar. Um, and I thank everyone for their time. I see that a few questions have been posted. Um, how long have we been in the industrial cleaning space? We've been in business just um, well over 50 years, about 52 years. And um, that's how we started is in, in the industrial cleaning space. So half a century um, is a um, good way of putting that. Uh, what disinfection process do you use? So whoever asked that, I encourage you to reach out to me, you know, offline as well. I can really get in depth for the safe, safety of, um, for the purpose of time, I guess. Um, I'll just put it to you this way. We use um, a spray on method to make sure that we can clean and disinfect in localized areas and make sure that we're effective. Uh, we use an EPA approved um, agent, which is, has a cleaner in it um, that's able to lift grease and disinfect. Um, it is EPA approved for effectiveness against COVID-19 and the emergent pa pathogen COVID-2. Um, so again, if you're looking for even more detail, please feel free to uh, email or call me. Doesn't look like there's any more questions. Again, the, the Grizz, Dennis, and I thank everyone for your time. Have a great day. Have a safe outage. And we'll catch you on the next monthly webinar. Thank you. Be healthy and safe, everyone.